Hello everybody. What's going on? We got Ben here today with Dodi Hemko. Would you like to just introduce everybody to what you're doing? Yeah, so um, my name's Ben. Um, I run Dodi Hemp Products and also Indie Extractions. Um, we've been at this for about a little over two years in the CBD space and we kind of, you know, as everyone did, transitioned over into the Delta 8 space, yeah. other cannabinoid space. So we've been doing that for, well, about a year and a half, two years now. Um, I, I like to say that we were one of the first doing conversions, but we didn't necessarily launch products, you know, to end customers. Sure. You know, um, we were really big on making sure that we were following guidelines and not, you know, taking loopholes that would get us into trouble later. Absolutely. So, um, you know, we weren't one of the first to get a product out there, but as far as like what was going on in the lab, we were we were dabbling a long time ago. Sure. And you guys, uh, you said that you were also doing CBD processing at the start of everything, right? Sure. Um, were you doing like ethanol extraction, propane extraction, or anything of that nature? Um, so we were not doing any sort of hybrid hydrocarbon extraction. Okay. We stuck with ethanol, um, and you know we had a thirty-gallon machine that sure. could wash, um, you know, thirty pounds every fifteen minutes. Wow. You know, um, but what that turns into is it, it seems like you can just turn and burn it really fast. But you know, as we learned here. Um, it took a lot of manpower, it took a lot of square footage, yeah. um, it took a lot of like waste management and you know, um, adhering to a fire code that yeah. exactly they're not talking to us about yet, so we're kind of looking into other states, or I guess we were looking to other states for guidelines on how much to use at one time and you know, all of our control areas and things like that. Um, it got to a point where it was very complicated, expensive, and it's just not worth it. There were other hemp companies that were injecting millions of dollars into their operation, and they're pumping out 55 gallon drums of crude every day, and it's cheaper for us to just go buy it, sure. you know? Um, so that's kind of what we do now. Yeah. Um, we still own that machine, we're saving it for a rainy day, if you will, mm -hmm. um, but now we buy 55 gallon drums of crude, sure. and so um, we focus on finding a good source and yeah. being able to do what we want to do with that. Understood. <laughs> That subject, uh, you were talking about as far as the tolling and it not necessarily being economically viable for a lot of the players out there. On that subject, it reminds me of around 2020 or early thereabouts is when we started to see, like at least on my end, a lot of the consumer sold Delta 8 products that started popping up. Is that as a result of CBD not necessarily buying, being viable for the public at large? Or where do you think that came from as far as its introduction directly in parallel with what COVID did? Um, I, I think that there was a huge oversupply. Sure. You know, I think people were diving headfirst into this and growing acres on acres on acres of hemp and just having really big dreams and big ideas. And there's a lot of really capable people out there. So they made these big giant operations and said, look what I created. Sure. Look at all this oil. Well, now what? Yeah. You know, it's like a dog that catches his tail, right? You know, now what? You did, you know, and so um, people were like, well, what do we do with this? Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, the price just kept going lower and lower and lower on the CBD. You know, you used to be able to buy or sell isolate for $5,000, $10,000 a kilo. Ooh. And now that stuff, you can, it can be had for $200, $250. Interesting. Um, and so people were trying to find a way to, you know, they're sitting on all of this product, you know, most of them. What do we do with it? Mm -hmm. And um, at least in my experience, the whole Delta 8 thing kind of became an accident. Sure. You know, if you're in the CBD space, everyone's still interested in THC, you yeah. know, uh, because they're trying to mitigate it, right? They're trying to um, follow the law, you know, provide people with a safe, easy, or a safe consumable product that they have easy access to. Um, but, you know, people didn't want to, again, skirt the laws in any sort of way. Sure. Um, for me, it was an accident. You know, I was um, trying to scrub and clean up some CBD to make it look better. Because sure. I was at this point where we had just produced all this CBD and we were like, well, how do we just make it better? And um, it came out in the jar, let it sit. Of course, when oil's hot, you know, it moves around. And so I didn't know then. It was when I went back, you know, two or four weeks later to look at my CBD. Sure. And I was like, well, this looks a whole lot like THC. You know, how it doesn't move. Uh -huh. It's very... You know, hard and you know if you hit it with a tool it sounds like glass yeah. um, and so I was very curious and even then the analytics weren't there hmm. you know if I sent that out somewhere and it wasn't just me I wasn't like the guy sure. this happened to a lot of what I refer to myself as a clandestine chemist it happened to a lot of us Understood. where we were like hey what's going on and we're discussing this online and I'm sending my my stuff out it looks great has great effects sure. but it's testing like hardly any CBD, what's going on? Interesting, so well, they just didn't have the standard. Exactly. Well, yes, it wasn't testing, it's a lot of CBD, because there wasn't a lot of CBD left. You know, early conversions still left some CBD in it, or they weren't doing it long enough for proper. Um, so there were just these results all over the board, and there was about a 
two-year window there where people were doing stuff behind the scenes where they were just sort of shooting in the dark. Sure. You know, and just going by the, um, the old test method. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's a lot of people who aren't afraid to give their product a try if they made it themselves. Absolutely. So, um, really, really cool. Thank yeah. you for that insight, man. I, so, once Delta 8 came out and, you know, everyone said, hey, there's this new cannabinoid, mm -hmm. I look at Chatty, my partner, and I said, I know how to make that. Yeah. You know, I've been doing that. And so um, I think a lot of other people did too. And then the information became easy to access, or people were selling it, and you know, everyone's doing Delta Eight now. Yep. Yeah. Uh, for our viewers, how would you prefer to consume Delta Eight personally? Are you a dabber, a vaporized guy, edibles? Uh, let's start off. Maybe I'll rephrase that question. Delta Eight is a distillate, correct? Yes. Would you explain to everybody how a distillate differs from an extract? Okay, so a distillate is actually, most easily said, it's a more refined extract. Sure. So an extract is something that comes raw, at least in my mind and how I communicate with other people, mm -hmm. an extract is something that comes raw off the plant. Sure. You know, so if you were to take ethanol or a hydrocarbon and make some sort of crude oil, yeah. um, you know, that would, is what I would refer to as an extract. Sure. Um, it's going to maintain all of your terpenes and flavonoids and even your impurities that come along with that extraction process. Um, distilling it takes isolates you know down to your cannabinoids sure. and you know takes out all the gross stuff that's you know too heavy and too light sure. and gives it you know generally if it's a good um, you know distillation flavorless odorless gotcha um, you know actually I'm going to emphasize that Understood. good distillate is flavorless and odorless so no rubbery smell no or rubbery, rubbery smell no burnt smell um, you know even some of the distillate that comes through our lab still has a little bit at the very end and you just have to know where it came from and where its further application is going to be. Sure. You know, we can strip it out if we run it one more time, but it depends, you know, what are we going to use that for? Absolutely. If we're going to turn it into something else later and it's going to end up getting redistilled at some point, it'll clean up that smell eventually. Understood. You know? Yeah. That leads into the follow-up then. How do you prefer to consume your distillate, regardless of which isomer or cannabinoid? I like to eat it. Understood. Um, you know, I, I've been a, a, like a really seasoned smoker for years, all sure. of the cannabinoids, and, um, Delta 8 for me and all of the other cannabinoids that we make here is definitely a huge on the convenience factor. And so, um, you know, I do vape it, you know, I keep one with me for, you know, when I can't, you know, smoke other ways, you know, where I want to be more discreet, things like that, always works, especially the new THCP stuff, it's, it's like, you know, just as good. Which, on that note, that brings us into something I wanted to talk about. We've seen both consumers, producers, retailers, whatever you want to say, numerous hemp cannabinoids, research chemicals, whatever you want to refer to them as, pop up even over the last year. You've got on your hand, or both hands at this point, what oh, yeah. novel compounds are out there. As far as your personal discretion, what do you consider to be a safe product and why? Um, I guess it would probably be easier to point out the ones that aren't safe sure. than, okay. than it would be because, heck, I don't know, I'll investigate both sides of the fence, but I'm not a real big fan of THCO. Okay. Um, I've used it, and when it's pure and when it's fresh, it's great. Yeah. You know, um, but I think that a common misconception in the beginning was that it was going to be some sort of super THC. Sure. And it's actually like if you're going to refer to delta eight as a light or a diet THC, yeah. then THCO is the diet diet. It, it really does not affect you very heavily. Sure. Um, I don't see a lot of really recognizable benefits yet. Mm -hmm. You know, although I'm not a clinical trial person. Sure. Yeah. Um, my biggest thing that I don't like about it is it's not shelf stable. Interesting. Um, so in a laboratory setting, we could store that stuff forever. Sure. You know, we could continue to remove oxygen, backflow with nitrogen, do whatever we needed to do to preserve it. Yeah. But most people in the you know product manufacturing space or you know manufacturing edibles, if they're going to buy those cannabinoids, it's going to go bad on them. Yeah. And a lot of people are making vapes with THCO Same. and. You know, those are exposed to very minimal amounts of oxygen over time, mm -hmm. and you'll see THCO products, you know, definitely get a little layer over time. Sure. But um, it's an acetate. So, like, um, it, it basically, in layman's terms, mm -hmm. it makes vinegar yep. over time. Uh, you absolutely. know, if I just want to skip to the end, um, you know, it, it basically breaks down, and you're, it's going to smell like vinegar, it's going to taste like vinegar, and that's because it is vinegar which isn't necessarily toxic sure. to consume or to vape, but it's also just not pleasant. Yeah, well said. So I was actually going to bring that up. You mentioned uh, the little uh, 
separation layer, and not only can oxygen do that, but water can also kickstart that process. Oh, right. percent And very yeah. interesting. So both, uh, even if you have a little cartridge sitting in the counter, like ambient humidity and just that small amount of oxygen will ultimately separate it. It's yes. Fascinating, right? And um, so, in addition to THCO, I'm not a big fan of, um, well, at least I'm, I'm a fan of it, but I don't see it lasting, sure. is Delta 10. Okay. So we actually have Delta 10 products, and they sell, they yeah. do well, and the early misconception, which has proven to be true, is that it gives you a really intense feeling really fast and it, and it goes away quickly. Okay. And so what I've gathered over time is that if you continue to use it, it gives you a headache. Sure. You know, because you just are hitting that thing all the time and, you know, it's, it's not necessarily good for you. Yeah. Um, the other side of it is knowing how all of these different cannabinoids are made and knowing necessarily how everyone else is making them. Sure. The catalyst that's used in making Delta 10, or at least the widely known one, mm -hmm. is really not safe. Sure. Like, and like I was saying about THCO, like hey, if you happen to get it or smell it, yeah. shouldn't be too concerned. But Delta 10 stuff is like, hey, if you're not getting it from a good source, sure. it, you should be concerned. Um, so that's another reason why I don't like that one. Gotcha. Um, THCP, I love it. Yeah. Um, the reason I do like it is because um, it requires like pharmaceutical level skills to create. Sure. So you're not getting that from someone's you know garage. Yeah. You know, you're, well, not, so you're not getting that from any sort of amateur setup. Mm -hmm. No way. And um, you know, so that's a reason why I generally trust it. It's very very expensive. Understood. I mean, we're talking you know hundred thousand dollars for a kilo, as opposed to D8, which is you know four five hundred dollars. You know. And that said, I was actually going to bring that up. We do a lot of secondary testing for the products that we bring into shop, and we've seen a lot of the companies out there advertising THCP, but also having that in, like like you said, because of the cost, one to like two percent maximum oh, as yeah. far as the concentration, and it still leaves a very distinguishable effect. Yeah, it's a fantastic product. I wanted to ask you though, as far as the THCP, you said it requires pharmaceutical lab grade setup to, in order to either convert. What, I don't want to go into verbiage on that one quite yet, but more so, would you say it's closer to a cannabinoid or a terpene in terms of its structural molecule? Oh, it's definitely a cannabinoid. Interesting. Yeah. So, as far as the suffix P goes, do you know what that stands for? I don't. I don't either. That's why I was asking. No. <laughs> and, and <laughs> Always learning. Worth, worth mentioning in, yeah. in this interview, my background is not chemical, it's mechanical engineering. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I do have a degree from Purdue University, and you know, I studied some chemistry in school, yeah. and I was good at it. Um, so everything that I've learned here has been, you know, self-taught sure. to an extent. And so when we start getting really deep into organic chemistry, I love that stuff. It really resonates with me. I understand a lot of it, but you know, I'm not going to have the same sort of level of insight as like, you know, PhD yeah. in chemistry, sure. you know, and things like that. And so I do have a lot of friends and people I've met in the industry that I reach out to try to sort of have these discussions, yeah. um, you know, so. You ran a successful extraction cannabis industry for years, however. So yes. it's not like you just jumped into the industry and you really knew what you were doing. You said you were out in California a while back, right? Mm -hmm. And then Kentucky? Yes. So I was in California for a little over five years, sure. and I went there in 2013. Like, I graduated from Purdue, and I was on the road within, like, a week or two sure. with my best friend. And, you know, just sort of this whole idea that, like, hey, um, you know, the cannabis industry is going to need real engineers. Yeah. And so I'm just going to go out there and dive in head first. Yeah. Um, so five years later, fast forward, I had developed a small, you know, extraction brand. I was on the shelves of roughly 16 different dispensaries in the Sacramento area. That's an accomplishment. Yeah. yeah. It, it certainly paid the bills too. Um, had a lot of overhead. Taught me a lot about being a business owner, sure. managing people, all of those things. It was relatively small though, you know, in um, comparison to some of the other players out there. Sure. But when 2018 happened in California, and they went legal on the recreational level, it changed everything, and it made it a significantly more cutthroat industry. Sure. Um, it made people very competitive, you know, the people you've always worked with and um, worked side by side, they were not coming for your throat, Yeah. you know, and they didn't necessarily want to share anything. Um, I had a lot of um, partnerships go bad and things go bad. People develop multi-million dollar companies, and I'm sure other people have heard of, and just completely leave me out. Um, and that's fine, you know, it's a free country, you know, you can cry about it or you can move on. Yeah. But I mean, um, here you are. Right. <laughs> and, and I get to be closer to home now, too, you know, so everything happens for a reason. Well, thanks back for coming back home to us, man. Like, yeah. it's, it's been insane having you in the state. I did want to ask, since you said you're a mechanical engineer and have this background more so as far as, like, that, I guess you could say, objective quantitative side of it rather than the organic chemistry, 
if somebody wanted to get into extraction, distillation, or this alternative industry as a whole, there are many ways of learning in an accredited environment. And do you have any guidance or kind of here's your start to your journey and these would be useful resources? Any suggestions for our viewers out there who kind of look into that? Um, I get asked that a lot. Sure. You know, and especially over the years, people who've watched what I've been doing on social media yeah. and whatnot, they always ask, you know, how do I get involved? And it's a similar answer to say for someone who wanted to get into cooking. You know, um, go work at a restaurant. Yep. You know what I mean? Um, there's no problem. Even if you had aspirations to start your own business, you know, you still got to learn from somebody else, right? Yep. And so you got to get in, and then you got to get in where you fit. Yep. And so um, it's hard to find places like in Indiana that are, you know, especially in research level states and, you know, hemp industry states that a lot of it is not a very professional setting, and a lot of people strive for that. You know, they want something professional and routine. Um, there are a few places that you can go um, in Colorado and California that have schools. Mm -hmm. You know, um, they're generally short, you know, like a day or two, a few days, um, and they generally tie in with equipment manufacturers that sure. are trying to educate people on how to use the machinery. Too. Makes sense. Um, I don't know any off the top of my head, um, but, you know, they're out there. Yeah. Um, you know, the cannabis community is relatively small mm -hmm. once you start interjecting yourself. You know, so, um, you know, there's some forums, uh, a good forum to look at, future4200.com. Sure. We'll I mean, link, link them down in the description, by the way, guys. Yeah, I mean, I know that you use them. Um, you know, we've chatted about them in the you know, years past. Sure. So, um, very valuable resource. Just recognize if you're going to reach out to Future4200, it is an open source. Yep. Um, it doesn't mean that everything on there has been validated. There's a lot of really strong opinions, sure. um, things like that, but lots of good information. Um, I've always looked at it as a, an opportunity to find very valuable tidbits and then look into it further on my own. Absolutely. You know, so. well, thank you so much. Appreciate your time and sitting down with us, and thanks for everything you're doing for the state, man. Like, it's really an honor to be here. Uh, we will link Indie Extractions and Dodie Hemco down in our description below. And thank you, man. We love yeah. you. Thanks, man. And you as well. <laughs>